Hello and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rick. And today we are here to do our year-end wrap-up and review and maybe talk about some plans for next year. No resolutions. No resolutions, no. Well, drink more beer. Is that a resolution? <laughs> it's likely to happen anyway. <laughs> it's more of a lifestyle choice. Sure. Anyway, um, so uh, Rick is going to be here with me for the first part. We're going to talk about home brewing. Um, I know that this is a primarily fiber crafts audience, so if that is not your, your deal, we'll put a link to um, where you can skip ahead to more of the fiber arts kind of stuff in the video, but I hope you'll stick around. Um, we had a great year for homebrew, and I'm really proud of well, what you accomplished, but, you know, oh, the yeah. beers that we brewed together. Yeah, good, together, because it is a team effort in, in addition to just made, making time for me to be able to brew and do some of the things, but Sarah helps with bottling and kegging and just general inspiration, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we upgraded the brewery in April, um, our little home brew, and got you into sort of a more permanent situation. We had a whole video on that um, if you want to go back in our archive. Um, you can see that, but it seems like the induction burner and the basement setup with the sink and everything really kind of helped it be a more fun process. Yeah, well, uh, before I used to have to schlep all my stuff from the basement all the way outside, deal with either inclement weather or the dusty garage, then clean everything up and go back inside and up and back and back and forth, and it became more of a burden than a hobby, and mm -hmm. I decided I really wanted to find a place to call my own and originally it was going to be in the garage with what ended up becoming your craft room uh, mm -hmm. for your projects your soap making your lotion making and uh, washing fleeces and things right. so it worked out for both of us because that's a better mm -hmm. space for you and the basement's a better space for me so yeah the induction burner helps we don't have to worry about propane we're using electricity that we're already generating from our solar panels it's mm -hmm. been a win-win yeah Absolutely. Oh, and that's that's what I was going to say is too is that it also saves you from having to schlep kegs up and down the stairs, um, or in and out of the house. Um, yeah. Since they're already downstairs and the keg graders aren't downstairs, it just made sense to put everything down there. So, um, you brewed. I'll just remind everybody. Um, we the brewing process for the mead and the mellow mel finished. We tasted those finally. Um, you did the photo opportunity, which mm -hmm. was a pale ale. Correct. Um, we tried our first, um, kind of, uh, milkshake style with the strawberry melon ball IPA yep. with the lactose. Yep. Um, you developed the Braggot. Yeah. Remind us what that was. Yeah. So Braggot is a kind of a hybrid between a mead and a beer. So it uses grain and honey for the fermentables. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was kind of funny because neither one of us had ever had a Braggot, uh, but I saw a recipe in Brewer Magazine and decided to brew a Braggot. And I don't know if it's, you know, anything like what a Braggot supposed to be, but we liked it. And we had mm -hmm. our friend, Scott Russell, who's been on the show before both brewing with mm -hmm. us and other things. And he, uh, they came over for Boxing Day and, he liked it as well. So. Yeah, I'd say that was a success. I need yeah. to have some more of that. Um, and then most our most recent published recipe was the um, double IP metaphor is, and rainbows, whatever. And I feel like you really nailed the kind of the hot profile and the, the malty sweetness on that one. So that was really exciting um, for me as your uh, co-host and <laughs> mostly just tasting person. Um and then you brewed this delicious porter, which we're not going to get into. We will have a separate, ep separate episode about this, but this is Rick's latest creation in our um, custom glasses. So uh, look for that soon, probably in the next week or two. We'll do a whole episode. Mm. Then I better pace myself. But it is so good. Really, really, really good. Um, and this one we're calling Harry Porter. That's the Harry Porter. The Harry Porter. <laughs> <laughs> You can just uh, picture the guy at the train station with a big beard and like a Victorian thing right. carrying your bags. Carrying your two suitcases for you. Yeah, exactly. So, apropos. Um, great, great winter brew. So, we're looking forward to bringing you more. Um, we've already talked about a couple of ideas for this year. Yeah, yeah. Sarah and I have been talking about what we want to brew next, both for kegs and bottles. Um I'm mostly reserving the kegs for five-gallon batches because that's what they hold, and it's kind of wasteful to spend the whole day brewing for a three-gallon batch and putting it into a keg. Um, to that end, that, well, no surprises yet or no uh, no spoilers yet, but we're looking mm -hmm. at maybe a saison. Mm -hmm. 
and then you know, we'll see what goes from there. If you have any suggestions on something that maybe you've tried recently, love to hear from you. Yeah, nothing too weird, nothing too funky or sour or anything like that, but definitely if there's like something with a little bit of uh, an extra ingredient in it mm -hmm. or something like that, or a different kind of hop to try that you've been really liking, yeah. let us know. Well, we the five-gallon kegs are for the, the beers that we like a lot, like you know your, your good porter, a pale ale, something that you, you know, it's not a specialty beer. Mm -hmm. The bottles end up being things that we're like, you know, a chai braggot or something like that. Maybe something that uh, is a one-off or something that we're just taste, yeah. you know, testing out. An experiment or maybe something where we're going to do a smaller batch. We just want to bottle it and, mm -hmm. you know, have less of it to, to get through, but, um, but still try it out. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you talked about was doing more meads because you got that mead book as a gift from yeah. one of your coworkers. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a challenging thing. I, and mm -hmm. with that, at least with mead, it's really easy to do small batches. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have a couple of three gallon carboys, but you can, one could easily do it with just a couple of gallon containers. And so I might experiment with something like that, get some local honey, and then try something mm -hmm. out. Right, I haven't told Sarah about this. Right now, I'm leaning towards maybe a maple syrup raisin uh, with maybe some sort of little Ooh. oak clove or uh, cinnamon or nutmeg or something in a very small okay. quantities. Um, I'm done with that. You did ask me the other night if I like raisins. <laughs> I was like, for like, context, please. <laughs> in, in what? <laughs> in my chocolate chip cookies? No. In my meat? Yes, very much. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Raisins would have been a uh, sugar source that would have been used mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious what it'll do. But there's the recipes are endless when it comes to mead. There's mm -hmm. a Reddit group where people just post all the unusual, I wouldn't say weird, but all the unusual things that they've tried. Mm -hmm. and it's always inspiring. Kind of a, a, a vaguely sweet, dry, blank canvas for any flavor or combination or profile that you want to put on it, yeah. it seems like. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. Is. it really is. I mean, you can have savory meads, mm -hmm. sweet meads, dry meads, uh, fruit meads, anything you want. Mm -hmm. Super cool. So, yeah. If the, Again, if, like Rick said, if you have any suggestions or you have anything you'd, be, you'd like to see us try and see if we can do it, uh, <laughs> I don't know, challenge us. Challenge exactly. <laughs> and uh, otherwise, we just hope that we will inspire you, um, as Rick said before in our previous episodes when we were talking about mead, you know, it's a really easy way to get into home brewing. You don't need a lot of specialized equipment. You don't have to grind grains. You know, you just need honey and some water and a bucket, and you're good to go. So yeah. um, even if you're not going to take up home brewing as a full-time hobby, just just play around and see what you can come up with. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. And I think Sarah asked me if she wanted me to talk a bit about what my plans are also for the new year as far as the brewery is concerned. I mm -hmm. use the term brewery loosely. <laughs> uh, There's my spot in the basement. It's not even a man cave. It's, it's our, my spot in the it's basement. It's our home brewery. <laughs> That's what it is. It is. It is the Gage Hill Crafts Brewery. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to continue to work efficiently, not just in like brewing method, but also in the time spent. Um, I was going to make a joke is that the down in my brewery setup is also where the washer and dryer are. And mm -hmm. it's one of those things I, I don't. And like I don't just sit around, so I'm not sitting around while I'm brewing. If there's time to do something, I'm cleaning the basement or I'm doing laundry or I'm coming up with something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue to look for ways to be more efficient that way, as well as inefficient in my water use and, and other things. Yeah, great. So we'll let you know what kinds of, um, to me, the, the, the brewery is a continual process of improvement, you know, refining, finding better tools, better ways to do things, as Rick said, using less water, less fuel, less electricity. So yeah, I'm just um, impressed. I hadn't yeah. seen this list you created and I'm impressed. We actually got a good deal of brewing in the last year and mm -hmm. I hope that trend continues because Absolutely. before it was, it really felt more like a chore than a hobby having mm -hmm. to go outside and get some propane. Do we have any propane? Oh, the propane's running out. Oh, it's windy outside. Right. Oh, it's cold outside. And oh, and you have to set everything fun. up and break it down. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm really glad. I mean, yeah. I'm the beneficiary of course, <laughs> buying like, these things for anniversary gifts and, and whatever, but by request. Also, also, I do want, I think creativity in any, in any way is important for every person to have, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, and it should be fun and not arduous. Yeah, so. I agree. Well, thanks for supporting yeah. it. <laughs> hey, sure. Thanks for brewing. So cheers, everybody. And with that, we're going to conclude the brewing segment, and we'll move on to other things.
Thank you. Thanks for watching. All right, so on to fiber crafts. Um, as you'll see, or as you probably noticed, I'm now by myself, and I'm also um, recording this in the daytime. I had a bunch of yarns and things that I wanted to show you, and I knew that we weren't getting the best light um, last night when Rick and I were recording the segment on homebrewing, and so I just decided to record that this morning instead. Um, so it's been a, an interesting year for me personally, project-wise. Um, it's been a great year uh, starting my design journey um, that really started back in 2018 with my first published patterns. I've been designing a few um, a few patterns for my own use since about 2012, 2013, but hadn't really worked them up into a usable state until last year. And this year just found a lot of inspiration and support from uh, my little corner of the fiber community and managed to put out um, seven patterns this year, which was pretty incredible. Um, so, and I also want to say thank you all for your support of buying the patterns um, or even just looking at them and favoriting them in Ravelry. That helps the Ravelry algorithm to show them to more people. Um, and I really appreciate it. As someone who is very passionate about knitting and has never really had another hobby or interest that has um, captivated me and motivated me the way that knitting has, it's really such a pleasure to share that interest with you all and to be able to play around with designs and publish things. Um, it's a real pleasure and a real privilege. So thank you. Um, as part of that uh, design process, I've also um, uh, been able to raise money again with your support um, and there were a few promotions and patterns going on throughout the year um, some of these are ongoing um, and some were kind of a one one off um, but I'm happy to report that um, in 2019 that we raised um, money for a few important organizations and these are not going to be large amounts uh, folks um, you know I've only sold maybe a hundred patterns total um, no, less than that, sorry, more like 70 patterns total since I've been publishing them. So, you know, I'm just, I'm not well known, um, enough and, and that's fine. Um, I'm just starting out too. So no complaints, but you know, if, if I want to brag and say we raised $10 for this, um, this particular cause, um, that may seem kind of funny to, to want to point that out. Um, because $10 isn't a huge amount of money, but at the same time, it's something and every dollar counts, right? When you're trying to support, um, uh, causes that you believe in or efforts, um, pooling your money with other people's donations does add up. So, um, a shout out to all of you who have bought patterns this year. We raised, um, from the Fiery Foliage Scarf, we raised $10 for the Friends of Great Kids Farm organization, um, out of Baltimore. We raised $30 for Baltimore Youth Hearts, um, which is a fantastic organization um, that Neighborhood Fiber Company contributes to. And because uh, they were supporting them, I was inspired to do that too um, with the release of the Inner Harbor pattern, uh, which used the Neighborhood Fiber Company yarn. And then for December, um, your purchases of the Bethel hat um, uh, raised $20 for Project Semicolon, which uh, works towards uh, sewer suicide prevention and mental health support um, in the United States. So again, thank you for um, all of your support, not just for me, but for these other organizations. Um, and thanks for taking a chance on knitting one of my designs. I really appreciate it. Um, please be sure to tag me and use the appropriate hashtags um, on social media because I would love to celebrate with you as you uh, work these patterns. Um, on a personal note, 2019 also brought some new kinds of projects into my life. Um, I'll talk about knitting in just a second. Um, but it also brought in uh, one of a sewing project. Um, it's been my first sewing project in a long time. Um, and that was the skirt and sash that I made myself for our Burns Night um, celebration back in February. That was a lot of fun. And I'm looking to sewing more in 2020 um, now that I have... Uh, a working sewing machine and a refinished sewing table. Um, that was a recent uh, project episode uh, that you can go back and look look up on our YouTube channel. Um, you know, now that I have a, a working 
sewing setup. I'm really looking forward to making new clothes for myself. Um, 2019 was definitely the year of natural dyeing for me. Um, I had done a lot of natural dyeing in previous years, but this is kind of a culmination and, and further exploration of that. And I certainly had quite a few episodes about different kinds of natural dyes and tried a bunch of uh, different natural dyes that I'd never experimented with before. I also grew a bunch of natural dye plants. Um, and the dye garden was, was basically the dominant uh, garden that we had this year. We didn't really grow any vegetables, um, but we did a lot in the dye garden. And I still have a lot of plants that I've harvested from that experience. And so I look forward to sharing some of those with you in 2020. As a quick aside, um, Maria of Ninja Chickens um, and the Ninja Chickens podcast is a very talented and very experienced natural dyer, and she has quite a few episodes on her YouTube channel, um, particularly on uh, natural dye techniques and um, sources that I haven't talked about yet, um, including indigo. Um, she also does quite a bit with eco printing, and I know that a bunch of you enjoyed my eco printing um, episode, and she's incredibly experienced in eco printing as well. Um, she does it onto a lot of different materials. So if you're interested in these topics, I encourage you to go check out the Ninja Chickens podcast on YouTube um, with Maria. And she is, um, in her latest episode, she talked about putting together a natural dye gardening along um, for the year. So if you have space to grow dye plants and you're interested in getting started, this would be an amazing resource. Um, the Ninja Chickens group on Ravelry where Maria will be um, sharing information and also calling on all of us to share what we're able to grow in our different climates and different growing conditions um, and helping those of you out who may be new to natural dyeing, not sure what you can grow um, or not sure what might be the easiest to get started with in terms of growing your own natural dye plants. So um, again, check, check that out. That's an exciting project and I'm hoping to be involved in some way. Um, this upcoming year because of course I do plan to grow some more natural dye materials here on the farm. Um, I'm also thinking about running at least one workshop here for natural dyeing and it would probably be another all-day event. Um, so I'm going to send out a, a newsletter about that soon. Um, sometime in the first two weeks of January I'll send out kind of a call for ideas of what people would want out of that workshop. Um, again it's going to be a relatively small class. I, I like to limit um, these very labor-intensive workshops where you're harvesting plants and processing materials um, to about five or six people. So it'll be a small class. Um, it'll be here on the farm in central Vermont. And if you want more information, just sign up for our newsletter. And that's on our website, gaychocrafts.com. Um, so all of these new projects uh, were, were a lot of fun to get involved with. Um, I did do a little bit of spinning. There were two episodes uh, here on the channel where I talked about spinning projects. Um, so there were a lot of other um, project types of projects that I did for the first time this year. Um, I led my first ever test knit back in December of uh, last year into January of 2019. Um, I had a sock uh, test knit uh, group in Ravelry and um, I realized that I could have run that test knit better um, but in terms of the t participation of everyone who did the test knit everyone completed their projects everyone was really helpful in their um, comments on the pattern and their suggestions for clarifying a few points and so that was really amazing um, I've seen a lot of discussion uh, kind of in the knitting and crochet world about the role of test knitters and you know, the fact that they're providing a lot of free labor in a lot of cases. And so I do want to be conscious of that and not take advantage of anyone or, or have anyone feel like they've been taken advantage of if they choose to participate in a test knit. And so I'm kind of debating when, when and why I might do test knits in the future. I definitely think they can be beneficial to both the knitters and to the designer. Um, but I do want to tread carefully there and make sure that everyone's um, really benefiting and engaging fully in the process. Um, to that end, I will briefly mention this um, is one piece of a new design that I'm working on for this year. Uh, it's going to be a striped poncho, and this is one half of it. 
Um, and I'm going to do a test knit in this case because I would like to provide the yarn for everyone to knit this in a bunch of different palettes. And I have, I have, I think, five or six more sort of kits of yarn made up. Um, so perhaps in my next episode, I will give you more details about this and do my official call um, for test knitting. The pattern's basically done. It's, I think it's done enough to test knit. It might not be beautifully formatted, um, but it's basically finished. And I just wanted to finish my second piece of my poncho so I could sew it together and kind of show you what you'll be making. Um, I know I did a, a semi teaser of this um, a few weeks ago on Instagram and a, a number of you um, expressed interest and so I'll be contacting you again to see if this is a good time um, to, to get involved um, and then be mailing everyone's yarn out to them. Um, so, But again, more details on how we're going to divvy that all up and, and run it and what the time frame is going to be. Um, I'll put that up. Uh, that'll be a good first project of January, I think. That'll be great. Um, other first time things, I also uh, participate in my, in my first test knit for somebody else, and that was with the sweater that I'm wearing. This again is the Manu uh, pattern from Isabel Kramer, um, and if you missed it, um, I did do a whole video on this sweater and the test knit process for it, as well as my modifications to her design um, for a better fit. And so um, you can see, you can find that video back um, in our YouTube channel. Uh, list of videos there, um, but that was a lot of fun and I look forward to having an excuse to test knit for other people. Um, it, it's not something that I'm going to be uh, doing super regularly, but just keeping my eye out for those designs that really catch my attention, maybe that I, I, want, I know I want to knit right away. Um, and test knitting is a great excuse and it's great to have a deadline. I like to work towards a deadline, so um, that's always a nice thing. So speaking of future knitting and future projects, I did want to quickly um, first mention actually um, kind of total knitting uh, for this year. Um, and again, this isn't meant, it's not meant to brag or to show off or anything like that. Um, it's just more, I think, interesting um, because it's, for me, I don't really play on my year of knitting in a lot of detail. And so it's interesting to reflect back and look and see what I've done and see if there's any, um, you know, uh, correlation from year to year or kind of what my what my trends were or what I was gravitating towards. Um, so I'll just give you a quick rundown. I did, I finished 18 projects in total, um, six pairs of socks. Uh, many of those were a very bulky weight sock. Um, a couple of, a couple of uh, kind of standard pairs of socks as well. Um, two sweaters, three large wraps or ponchos, four hats, and three sets of mitts or mittens. Um, and the hats and mittens, some of those were um, very small, very uh, child size or baby size, um, because some of those were charity knits as well. So, you know, 18 projects in total, I feel pretty good about that. It's definitely more than one a month. Um, and a couple of larger, um, several larger pieces in there, including my t uh, sample knit for the Don't Wait Up shawl that I released, as well as two garments um, for myself. So... It's nice to see, even though I kind of lost my knitting mojo, I would say between May and July, I really wasn't knitting very much at all. Um, it's just nice to see that I actually, you know, did put out quite a bit of knitting this year um, and finished a lot of things. Um, I am a product knitter and I get a little stressed out and distracted when I have too many things going on at the same time um, or too many unfinished things or abandoned items laying around the house. Um, I really like to finish things and, you know, either give them away or wear them myself. Um, and so, you know, it's just nice to, to review again and, and see that sense of completion and, and, uh, and accomplishment. So I hope you had a good, you know, good crafting year of whatever you were making. And it's not about how much, but about, um, how much you enjoyed it and, you know, how you can reflect back and be proud of what you made. Um, so looking to the future, um, I did put a post up on Instagram about the Make Nine Challenge, um, and if you don't know, this is a, a an, this is a broad uh, maker kind of challenge. It can be make any any nine things. It doesn't have to be knitting. Um, it doesn't even have to be you know, textile related. I think you know the prompt is pretty broad in terms of making just making nine things in a year. 
um, which seems pretty feasible. And again, I don't always like to join in on um, these kind of popular deadline driven things because it can feel kind of limited. Um, but I did get inspiration on joining the Make Nine from uh, Mars of Hey Brownberry, the Hey Brownberry podcast. Um, and uh, she's also a designer that I, I really like her designs a lot. And she, for the last couple of years, um, has posted her Make Nine in a way that it, that is not locked into specific items or specific patterns, but it's just more of a general um, category, she calls them, in terms of, you know, the kinds of things she wants to make or just reminding herself of wanting to try a new skill or wanting to um, be able to use her hand spun more, things like that. Um, so it's, it's almost a way of kind of corralling intentions that you already have and then putting them together in this nice um, little package. Um, so for my make nine, I'll just read them to you really quickly. Um, there's a sweater for me. I want to make something for charity. I'd like to sew another item. Uh, I want to make something with leather. I got some really nice veg tan leather from a company in upstate New York um, a couple of years ago and I haven't done anything with it. And so I want to make something out of that leather. I want to make something for my partner. Um, Rick's always already given me a suggestion of something he'd like to have for this year. Um, I am going to make at least one new original design. Um, I'd like to work with a new to me yarn and I'd like to continue with my sheep to sweater project, possibly even finish it, although that's a little ambitious, um, but it's always nice to kind of push yourself. Um, the sheep to sweater project was another new thing that I took on in 2019 and began this year. Um, and that's going from shearing the sheep all the way up to knitting and finishing a sweater for myself. Um, and I've shared a couple of episodes so far about the preliminary stages of skirting and washing. But I want to continue that on and really um, see if I can finish uh, that whole process this year. If not, that's okay. I'm not going to beat myself up over it but it's a nice motivator to kind of put it into the Make 9 and see if I can finish it in 2020. That'd be kind of fun. And then I have one um, in the middle here that just says open space. And again, you know, each of these things is a category. You know, I can make whatever I want for my charity make. I can sew whatever kind of garment I want. Um, you know, the sweater for me, that could be any style of sweater, any color. Uh, I'm not gonna lock myself into specific things um, right now. It's just a nice prompt to kind of organize my thinking around and again to remind myself and say, oh yeah, I wanted to make something out of that piece of leather I have, or oh yeah, I wanted to get my sewing machine out. Um, so let me know if you're if you're doing the Make 9 or if you're thinking about um, doing something similar, some kind of you know year-long commitment, um, let me know. Um, I'd love to hear about it and hear about your progress. Now I do have some specific patterns that I'm hoping to make this year, or have plans to make this year. Um, I don't know if they will fit neatly into my Make 9 categories um, or not, or if I'll use them for that or use the Make 9 as other motivation, um, but I did want to tell you about uh, some of the things that are at the top of my mind right now um, and just kind of share those in case you haven't seen them. Um, the first is a pair of patterns and I have a little story to tell on myself. So when the uh, Jurek pullover um, first appeared, I think I first saw it on Instagram and then I went on Ravelry to read more about it, um, that really captured my attention. I love the lines of this. Um, I love the yarn that's used. It's the Harrisville Designs um, Highland yarn, which I've used in my own designs, and I absolutely love this yarn. It's... Um, it's worsted spun and it's blended before the, co the color is added and it's blended um, in the carding process before it's spun up. And so you get this incredible um, depth of color and complex color. Um, I have actually a skein of it in front of me. This isn't necessarily the color I'm going to use for my sweater, but so you can see like this is an autumnal orange, sort of a burnt orange, but there's yellow and red and brown and green and all kinds of stuff in there. Um, you know, this is mostly a chartreuse color, but you've got green and yellow and gold and teal, all different kinds of colors in here. So I really like that yarn and I wanted another, um, I, was, I was happy to have another excuse to knit with it. 
Um, but looking at this sweater and thinking about what I have in my wardrobe, I kind of wanted a black um, sweater um, or a pseudo black sweater. And I thought that that, you know, having a very dark color would look cool in this. Um, and then I remembered that Harrisville has another yarn that I've been dying to try. Um, and that's their line called Nightshades. Um, if you uh, pay attention to any other podcasts that are heavily knitting focused, you will probably have heard of this yarn or seen it at a festival. Um, this was kind of a surprise yarn that Harrisville developed a couple of years ago. I believe it was the son of the, the current owner who, who thought, oh, you know, what if we came up with a line of, of yarns that are black, but they're tinted different shades of color? Um, or black blended with other colors and you know the story goes that the the father was just kind of like yeah right you know nobody's gonna want to buy all this black yarn good luck you can do a small run of it but we'll see what happens and they took it to Rhinebeck and they sold out the first day um, and then what I heard was that they had to call um, the mill in New Hampshire and have somebody truck in overnight more yarn um, for this for the Sunday for the second day of um, of Rhinebeck and so you know this this has this cachet around it um, I'm sitting here petting this game that I have I'll show you in just a second um, but it has this cachet around it it it's incredibly soft um, which is a little bit different for them a lot of Harrisville yarns I would describe as as a bit toothy um, and you know, if, if you're not into wooly wool, um, most of the Harrisville line probably isn't going to be for you. Um, I absolutely love it, and I don't find it uncomfortable at all to wear. Um, but some people are just very sensitive, um, have very sensitive skin, and I understand that. So Nightshades uh, is made with American Cormo, which is a fine wool, and it is very, um, very soft. Um, it's also a little bit thinner than the Highland, which the sweater calls for. The direct pullover calls for and so I thought well I should you know I should get a skein of this and um, and I should knit something you know knit something else knit a small project knit a swatch um, but I'm not much of a swatch knitter um, I will swatch for sweaters um, but in terms of you know sitting down and knitting lots of swatches to, to get the feel for things I'm just not that into it I'd rather make a thing a small thing um, and try it out that way and in my head, um, so the so the Jurek pullover. Let me back up. Jurek pullover is um, a design by uh, a woman named Einor Berkimbeeva, and Einor. I'm pretty sure I got your first name right, but if I screwed up your last name, I apologize. Um, Einor is a very talented designer, and she's been um, submitting a lot of designs to bigger publications uh, lately. Um, and so the Jurek pullover originally appeared in the Harrisville Designs Fall Winter Collection for 2019. Um, but it is also available, that whole collection, you can buy individual patterns or you can buy the entire ebook, um, which I think is nice. So I got that pattern and I started reading through it and I was trying to, you know, decide based on the needle size, it calls for mostly a US 6. Um, based on the needle size, I thought I could probably get away with using. The Nightshades was a little bit lighter weight. This is more of a DK weight where the Highland is more of a worsted. Um, but I still wanted to make something just with Nightshades just to try it out and see if I liked it at that gauge, see if I thought it would make a nice sweater. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, there was a hat recently that I saw somewhere and I think the hat's made with Nightshades. Maybe I could make the hat. So I go on this little mini quest I find the hat pattern, lo and behold, same designer, Einor designed the Alatau hat, um, which has similar lines, um, and I think because I had remembered it, it was made with nightshades and it had that same kind of diagonal um, line pattern as the sweater does, my mind kind of, you know, collated the two, um, and so there you go, hat swatch. Um, and I'm laughing because uh, in a, another Ravelry group I'll tell you about in just a second, um, I noticed this morning that they were talking about hat swatches for, for that sweater project. Um, so, you know, I, I know this is not an original idea, um, but yeah, knitting a hat out of the yarn that you're thinking about for a sweater 
um, is a great idea because for those product focused people uh, like me, you still end up with a thing that you can wear. Um, but it also allows you to play around with the yarn and get a feel for the yarn and, and see if you like it. Um, so I'm going to knit the Alatau hat out of um, this skein of Nightshades yarn, which I ordered for myself. This is one that is blended with a dark or a medium blue. Um, the Let's see, the model of the Alatau hat is wearing one knit um, with a, a shade in a lighter blue. That's called Last Call is the name of that one. And this is Dashboard, so it's going to be darker. Um, it does almost look black, but maybe if I hold it right there, you can kind of see on this outer edge, there's like a hint of, bl of blue happening. You can see that just a little bit. So this stuff is impossible to show on camera. Um, I've, I've seen many podcasters try and fail to show you what color of nightshades they have. Um, anyway, I'm really excited about that. this. It is, it's very bouncy. Um, the Cormo also has a lot of springiness to it. And um, of course, wool and spun yarn also has sporginess to it. So um, this is gonna be a beautifully delicious hat. Lots of interesting um, texture on it. It's also, um, the Alatau is also knit from the crown down, which I've never done before. So uh, lots of excitement. Um, I will caution you that the Alatau hat is not available as an individual pattern yet. Um, and when I contacted Aynor, she, or I'm sorry, Aynor, um, she said that it will be a year before that's um, released as an individual pattern because this was um, published in an issue of Pom Pom Quarterly and that's just the way that they do their publications. They, they have each issue as a complete issue for about a year and then they um, uh, break that up and offer the individual patterns for sale. Um, and I think that's completely fair. You know, it's it's very time consuming and very labor intensive and very costly to run a print publication. Um, and so, you know, being able to get a little bit of extra funds up front um, by selling complete issues um, before you offer individual patterns is, I think, a, you know, it's a perfectly fine business model. Um, an issue of the electronic book only of Pom Pom Quarterly, uh, which is the way that I would get it, um, is 11 pounds, 11 uh, British pounds, and um, there's 10 patterns in there. So I did the math, and that works out to about $1.43 US per pattern. So I still think that's a pretty good deal, um, even if you only wanted to knit one or two patterns in there. Um, it's not going to be a whole lot more, more money than, than paying for a single pattern on Ravelry. Um, and Pom Pom's a beautiful magazine. It's really well put together. Um, they certainly represent a huge range of diversity in terms of, you know, not just the people that are modeling the clothes, um, but the designers, the people who are doing art direction for them, um, the, the style and the kind of the different projects that they come out with, um, the, the fit and the way things fit onto different bodies. Um, you know, they do a good a good job of representing a broad range of the population and so I think Pom Pom is one of those publications that you know you always want to look at their lookbook and see what they have out for that quarter because you're bound to find something um, interesting or that would look great on you um, or somebody that you're knitting for. So um, so again if you want to knit the Alatau hat along with me um, grab some nightshades and um, get the uh, issue 31, the winter 2019 issue of Pom Pom Quarterly. And you can get that online. Um, they're, they're, they have subscriptions for their print magazine and they, they do sell individual copies on their website, but they often will sell out. So you can't always get the print issue. Um, I'm not so bothered by that because I really prefer an ebook version anyway. I don't like to store, you know, tons of magazines and books um, in my craft room. So, so there's that. Um, Pom Pom is also hosting a winter 2019 uh, make-along or CAL or CAL crochet along because um, they do have some crochet patterns as well. Um, and that is going until February 9th, uh, 2020. It's open now in their Ravelry group, the Pom Pom group. Um, I don't know if I will get this hat finished um, 
by February 9th, possibly. Um, but I may enter that cow just for the fun of it. Um, it looks like they do a cow for each quarter of the year. So, and you don't have to necessarily knit patterns from that issue. So it can be any pom-pom pattern that you're entering um, for a specific season or for a specific quarter for a make-along. So, you know, that's, um, that's just a fun community thing and they do give away prizes uh, at the end of it if you finish your projects. Um, another project and make-along that I am planning to participate in this year is starting tomorrow, January 1st, 2020, and that's the Felix uh, knit-along, and that's being run um, in the Best Day Ever group on Ravelry, um, hosted by the hosts of the Best Day Ever podcast, uh, who are Trisha, or Tie-Dye Diva, and Arthella, who's also known as Eris Knits. Um, and the Felix is also a pattern I've talked about just a little bit here on the channel. I don't do a lot of finished object videos, but you've seen me wearing my red Felix in a few recent episodes. Um, and I'm going to make another one. Um, I got uh, some Green Mountain Spinnery um, Mountain Mohair yarn as a gift this season. And um, I, sp I had specifically requested this um, because I knew I wanted to make another Felix. And when Amy came out with the cardigan pattern version of her pattern, um, Amy Christophers is the designer of the Felix, um, which was originally just a pullover. Um, but when she came out with the cardigan version, she made it out of this yarn. Um, not this color, but the Green Mountain Spinnery Mountain Mohair. Um, so here it is in skein form. Hold it over here. Here we go. So here's his in skein form. Here it is in um, skeined up or caked up, ready to go. And this yarn, um, like the Letlopi, which is what Amy used for the pullover version, this yarn is a, a loosely single spun yarn. Um, and this one, instead of the hairiness that you get from the Letlopi, um, which is made from Icelandic wool from the Icelandic sheep, which are a hairy breed and they have a lot of um, there's a lot of fuzz and halo with that yarn. Um, the Mountain Mohair, as the name would apply, um, has mohair in it. And so even though this does not look particularly fuzzy right now, um, once I knit it up and wash the finished uh, sweater and get some of the residual spinning oils off of this, it's going to fluff up incredibly um, and it's going to develop a nice halo um, in the fabric. And so, yeah, I'm excited to try it. Um, this uh, project might tick off the new to me yarn box on my Make Nine, um, just because I've never, I've always kind of admired mountain mohair from the sidelines, but I've never been particularly drawn to any of the patterns that I've seen uh, out there with it. Um, and I was kind of, until recently, I was kind of on the fence about mohair and whether I really thought I would like wearing it or, or um, thought I wanted to use a lot of it. Um, but I've definitely ticked over into the pro mohair camp. And so I'm excited to try um, my first garment with this. Um, it's a lovely um, lightweight yarn and I think it's gonna make a beautifully warm but very lightweight sweater. So I'm excited to, to do that and to join in this cal again on the best day ever group on Ravelry. Um, there's uh, lots of chatter over there already. People are um, thinking about yarn choices, getting advice on um, maybe stash diving or using what they have already, um, and just, you know, some excitement about the pattern. And there's some first-time sweater makers there. There's also people who have already knit one or two Felixes and just love it so much that they're ready to dive in and knit another one. Um, so that's really exciting to see. And I, I also hear that um, Amy Christophers, again, the designer of the Felix uh, patterns, is going to be involved. She's going to be on, on hand to answer our questions um, and provide any guidance that we might need. And so between the people who've already knit the pattern and, and Amy's help, I'm sure that um, even if you're relatively new or new to this pattern or new to sweater knitting in general, there, there will be um, plenty of hand on, uh, uh, help on hand. <laughs> Plenty of help on hand um, for you um, during this make-along period. And so this make-along, um, like I said, starts uh, January 1st. There is going to be a live um, YouTube session with the hostesses um, at 2 p.m. 
um, on January 1st on the Tie-Dye Diva channel on YouTube. Um, and then, of course, it runs for two months, so to the end of February. So I think that's a very generous um, time frame. Um, even if you're not ready to cast on immediately, maybe you have something else on the needles right now that you want to finish up first. Um, you know, I, I think reasonably you could probably knit this sweater in about three weeks if you worked on it a little bit every day. So certainly two full months um, is plenty of time to knit this um, Felix sweater uh, in your choice of cardigan or pullover. So if that's of any interest, I hope to see you in those threads. Um, again, I'm not an official host or anything like that. I'm just really gung-ho. I'm a fan of um, the Best Day Ever podcast in general, and I'm a fan of this pattern. And so, you know, bringing those two things together, um, I knew I had to participate. So thank you to Trisha and Arthella for hosting. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to knitting, knitting along with you. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I might knit this year, and I guess I just don't want to firmly commit to anything else um, <laughs> in public. I have a few other ideas, but they're much more vague. Um, I do want to release my first sweater pattern this year. I would love to be able to do that. And it's a, an idea that I've just been sitting on and kind of tweaking in my head for over a year now. And I just, I need to get it out. Um, I need to release this idea into the world in the form of a finished sweater and a finished sweater pattern. And so I'm really looking forward to working on that soon. Um, I may do it in conjunction with the Felix. Um, my sweater pattern is of course gonna take a lot of mental space and a lot of time and careful calculation um, as, I, as I work out that pattern. And you know, the Felix is pretty straightforward. Um, so it might be nice, um, although it sounds like a lot to, to have going on, uh, it might be nice to have my design in progress going on at the same time as some kind of mindless knitting that I can turn to for a breather um, when I need it. Um, I also have a couple of designs that I'm working on for um, independent uh, companies or dyers that I had already spoken with them about um, earlier this year or earlier in 2019. And so I feel obligated to release those this year, sometime this year. Um, one of the nice things about being an independent designer and not working with um, other companies or having um, other publication deadlines is that, you know, you do have the freedom to take on things at your own pace. And if something's not ready for prime time, you can just wait and release it later. Um, and, and I really like that. Um, However, I don't want to be someone who, you know, asks for yarn support or um, proposes an idea to another creator and then sort of disappears and they don't hear back from you for six months, a year, two years. Um, so, you know, I do want to be responsible and responsive, um, especially where I've, I've kind of initiated an idea. So I'm hoping that one of those will be ready uh, ready to go and off the needles, ready for photography come March, April. Um, so released in the spring. And then the other one is probably going to take a bit more time. And because it's um, it's going to be an a set of accessories again um, for winter, so I'm thinking that one probably won't come out until the fall. Um, and so, but other than that, I'm just going to try to leave the year as open as I can. Um, 20, 2020 is looking very much like a transition year for me. Um, at least I hope it's going to be. Um, I'm looking at, you know, a lot of different shifts in work and in, in play and hobbies and that kind of thing. And so, um, I, I realize that I need to make space for those things. I need to make space for daydreaming and coming up with different ideas, um, and giving myself time to make decisions uh, on, on bigger commitments. And that extends to d things like designing and um, over committing on, you know, even just my hobbies um, and what I'm doing with that for the year. So um, I hope that you will also give yourself space and time to be creative uh, this year. Um, don't feel like you have to, you know, knit the latest, um, hot right now patterns or make that thing that everybody else seems to be making. Um, don't, don't hold yourself accountable to other people's um, standards that they've set for them themselves. You know, make what you're interested in, make what's inspiring you, 
Um, give yourself space to breathe between projects or between making decisions. Um, and just relax and enjoy whatever it is that you're, you're working on. Um, give yourself permission to do that. And I think it will be more fun and more uh, fulfilling in the long run. Um, so thank you for joining me for this uh, wrap-up of 2019. Um, again, I really appreciate all your support over the year, um, both in just, you know, being here, following along, paying attention to what we're putting out in the world um, on YouTube and on Instagram, um, buying my patterns, or, you know, asking me questions, engaging with me, making comments. Any of those things are really appreciated. Um, and I wish you all the best for the year. I hope you're all very well. Um, I hope you're all very supported in whatever it is that you want to do. And I hope you have a great year. And I look forward to continuing our making journey together. So thanks a lot for being here. And we'll see you next week. Cheers.